There was once a man who thought his elderly wife was going deaf. So he decided one day to test it. He stood in the kitchen and he shouted to his wife in the living room, Can you hear me, dear? No reply. So he moved a bit closer. Can you hear me, dear? No reply. So he went inside the living room and said, Can you hear me, dear? And she said, yes, for the third time, yes, I can hear you. <laughs> Sometimes it's tempting to think that God is deaf, isn't it? Why are you doing this? What's going on? Why are you listening to me? When actually it's we who are deaf. It's us. God is telling us things, but we're not listening. Revelation is a book that's been telling us things. It's been revealing things. The clue about revealing is in the name, Revelation. The problem is, though, that so often we don't listen. We've been seeing over the past few weeks that some parts of the book are about the future, uh, but lots of it is talking about the time in which we live now, the time before Jesus comes back. And we've seen history displayed, uh, sort of laid out to us, uh, as uh, seven, uh, seven seals on a scroll being taken up. It should be seven seals, but it's not. Seven seals on a scroll uh, being taken off. Six of them were opened in chapter six, and it ended with the sun disappearing, the stars falling out of the sky, the mountains and the islands fleeing, and the sky being rolled up like a scroll. The day of the wrath of the Lamb, we were told, the end. And chapter seven, which we looked at last time, was a flashback looking at those who would be saved on that day. That was those who had washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, gathered around the throne from every tribe, tongue, and nation. That's this picture. Here we go. Uh, gathered around the throne. Those who have trusted in Jesus' death on the cross to make them clean before God. But if we basically reach the end in chapter 6, then what's going on here? What's going to happen now if basically we've got to the end? Well, we're going to see in this chapter that we go round again. We sort of do this part of history again. But this time, instead of seven seals unlocking God's plan, the same events are viewed as seven trumpets, warning and forewarning of the end to come. Like the seven seals, there's a four, and then a two, and then a break, and then one by itself. So first of all, four warnings of decreation. Let me just read to you uh, verses one to five again. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire on the altar, from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. The passage begins not with the first trumpet, but with the seventh seal. There we go, the seven seals. Chapter 7 was the break, and now this is the one on its own, completing, number 7, what went on before. And the seventh seal brings silence in heaven, like the silence before the walls of Jericho were torn down. And then the wrath spoken of about at the end of chapter 6 is finally poured out on the earth. If you remember back in chapter 6, the saints were praying for that judgment, praying for that justice to be brought. And here, in response to their prayers... The incense, this is then thrown down on the earth. The final judgment has come. So what now? Well, now we have seven trumpets. That's what follows in that section. Now, trumpets have many functions in the Old Testament, but it would seem here they're about announcing the coming judgment. Again, think Jericho in Joshua 6, where seven priests carried seven trumpets, and on the seventh day they went round seven times blowing the trumpets until the final shout was given and the walls came crashing down. Except this time it's not Jericho, it's the whole world that it's talking about here. And the first four trumpets are a group and form four forewarnings 
if you like, of decreation, of destruction. The first trumpet, the first trumpet, affects the earth. The trumpet is blown and hail and fire and blood rain down from the skies. This is a combination of two of the judgment plagues on Egypt in Exodus. And the plague destroys a third uh, of the trees, a third of the earth, probably more meant by that small third of the land of the earth, and all of the grass. Now a third is not everything, but it is a significant portion. It's more than the quarter destructions that we saw in chapter 6, but it's not everything. The second trumpet affects the seas. A burning mountain is thrown into the sea. And uh, it turns uh, a third of the uh, waters to blood, again reminiscent of judgment on Egypt, especially the first one where the Nile is turned to blood and all the fish die. And here, a third of the sea creatures die, and a third of the ships are destroyed. So the ships, that affects humanity as well. The world is part of, uh, humanity is part of creation as well. So things, things linked with the sea are partly undone by this. The third trumpet affects lakes and rivers. A star falls from heaven and makes a third of the drinking water bitter, poisonous, <laughs> polluted. And the psalm's name is wormwood, which is a bitter herb. I've discovered this week it's used in the making of absinthe, vermouth, and insecticides. I think it's a really interesting combination. Absinthe, vermouth, and insecticides. And uh, in the Bible it's associated with bitterness, so it's used elsewhere in the Bible. Now if there were anything in Revelation that would make me consider changing my view as to how this fits with historical events, this one would be it. Um, the word for black herb, go, I didn't get a bit of expertise this morning later on, uh, the word uh, is sometimes black herb instead of uh, wormwood, and in Ukrainian, apparently, that uh, can be translated Chernobyl. Um, and it's the same uh, word used in uh, Ukrainian for wormwood and mugwort. Uh, Chernobyl, if you didn't know, was the site of a nuclear disaster in 1986. There's either a plaque uh, in the city commemorating it with a trumpet on, sort of go harking back to this passage. On the other side, though, this is not how it's usually translated. So I actually had a look in a Ukrainian Bible this week, uh, you know, trying to check it all out. And uh, normally, actually, it's translated as pollen. That's why the terrible uh, Ukrainian translated pollen, uh, not Chernobyl. So I always used to hear, oh, you know, you can read a Ukrainian Bible that says the star's name is Chernobyl. It's not. It's pollen. So that, that, that just makes me think. But on the whole, the big thing, though, is it's affecting uh, the water. We do see a third of all the drinking water is affected. And as a result, many people die. The fourth trumpet affects the heavens, heavens as in sky and space, not the spiritual dimension. And it's a throwback to the plagues of darkness in Egypt, the plague before the great final one. It's a scaled back version of what happens at the end of chapter 6, when the sky was rolled up like a scroll and all the stars fell down. Here again, it's just a third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the stars. A third of the sun is struck flattened, pummeled, literally. It seems to suggest that the sun would not shine for a third of its normal time, nor the moon. The very structure of day and night is sort of falling apart with this one. So what we see through all of these is decreation. The very fabric of the world is breaking apart. <clears throat> the first three days of creation from Genesis, which provide the building blocks of the world, are being undone. Not totally, but partially. Creation is groaning and creaking under God's judgment. And as with the four horsemen in chapter 6, God is withdrawing his blessings here. From the, away, he was withdrawing his blessings from the realm of men. Here God is withdrawing his blessings from the realm of creation. Not totally, but partially. And isn't this what we see in our world? A broken planet. You can hardly ignore it, can you, with people gluing themselves to stuff all over the place and stopping the roads and things. The surprise here, though, is that God is behind this. God is the one here who's breaking it. And if God is breaking it, then we will not be able to fix it. 
As much as we recycle or reuse or stop using CFCs or stop burning fossil fuels, we will never finally fully fix our world. Now please, please, please don't hear me wrong here. There's nothing wrong with doing those things. We're given a planet to look after, aren't we? We're to be good stewards of this world. But we mustn't somehow imagine that by doing these things we'll somehow permanently fix our world. Our world is broken for a reason. It points to the brokenness of our relationship with God. Now if this is sounding familiar to a few weeks ago, then it's because it is. Because this is the same message, we're going back over the same things, but from a different angle. The world is broken and that brokenness here is, is represented as warning trumpets. They're a global warning of what is to come. But it's not just the brokenness of creation that points to this big end that's coming. And so our second point, the deceptive torment of the devil. Have a read with me from chapter 8, 13 uh, to chapter 9, verse 6. Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft smoke rose, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke, <clears throat> from the smoke came locusts on the earth. And they were given power like the power of scorpions on the earth. An eagle flies by and pronounces woe on the earth. Eagles in the Bible function a bit like we think of vultures. It's not a good sign. It's like a bird of prey circling over a body. In chapter 4, the angels sang holy, holy, holy to God, emphasising the holiness of God. We'll hear the birds of prey sing woe, woe, woe to the earth emphasising its doom. The fifth angel blows his trumpet and John sees a star fallen to earth. Now it's unclear whether that's the same star as, as trumpet three or not, but here the star is treated as a person. He is given the key to the bottomless pit and opens it. Smoke arises from the bottomless pit and smoke blackens the sun and then turns into locusts who are given scorpion-like stings. Now, at this point, it sounded a bit more like a horror film, isn't it, really, than a Bible passage. But in one sense, it should do. Because when we read the rest of the book of Revelation, we discover that this passage uh, alludes to the devil himself. That's what it's talking about. He's called in verse 11, the angel of the abyss, Apollyon, Abaddon, the destroyer. It is he who is thrown down to the earth in Revelation, and in the rest of the Bible too. So Revelation 12, verse 9 and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole earth. He was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. That same passage starts with a third of the stars being taken out of the sky. So repeat. Or listen to Jesus' description of what his disciples had done in Luke 10. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Scorpions and serpents there associated with the power of Satan. Stars as well in the Bible are associated with angels, good and bad. Just one example, Revelation 1.20. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. We're also told in the Bible that the devil holds the power of death in Hebrews 2.14. Okay, so the fallen star here is the devil, and he's given the keys to the abyss. But what about these things that come out of the abyss, the weird sort of smoke locust things? Let's read a bit more about them, verses 4 to 6. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green plants, or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, 
but death will flee from them. They're reminiscent here of the, the eighth plague of Egypt, the plague of locusts. All of these sort of fit back with the plagues of Egypt. But here there are his fallen angels, demons, minions, evil spirits who torment people. Now that might sound strange and weird to us, but it's not strange and weird in the New Testament. As we said right from the start, the book of Revelation is telling us New Testament truths in Old Testament language. Well, that is a New Testament truth. In the Gospels, evil spirits cause people immense torment. They make people throw themselves into fires. They cause them to cut themselves. They cause sickness and disease. When Jesus cast them out in the New Testament, they beg not to be thrown into the abyss. Same phrase as we've got here, the bottomless pit, a reminder of where they come from. So the world here is pictured as being tormented by demons. Many of them here become so hopeless in their torment that they long for death, yet it eludes them. Suicidal, yet alive. Now I do believe that demons are real. I don't think possession by evil spirits is anything like as common as it was in the New Testament. And we certainly mustn't blame every sickness or torment on demon possession. But the description here helps us understand what they're doing, how they're acting in our world. Some of it's borrowed from Joel 2, where it's either describing an army as locusts or locusts as an army. People sort of differ between those two opinions. But many of the images are taken from there. They have teeth like lions. Again, an, an image from Joel. Breastplates of iron, impenetrable. Hair like women, all like Samson in their strength. They are vicious and merciless. And yet... They have human faces. Now I'm not saying here that demons have human faces as they sort of walk around amongst us, but it means that they work in normal human systems. So this torment doesn't present itself like some weird horror movie with half locust, half horse things attacking your brain, but it happens in the normal passage of everyday human life. The demons remain unseen, only their effect is felt, and their effect is utter torment and hopelessness. And I want to say that the devil is still at work through his minions in the world today. In the West we live in an anti-supernatural society, don't we? So to go around possessing people, if the devil was doing that, that would sort of give the game away a bit, wouldn't it? If the devil was doing that in our society. But the devil does still torment. His influences are still felt in despair and hopelessness, in damaging and abusive relationships in destructive addiction and sin. Tormented souls are bound, whether through demonic influence or not. We live in a tormented world. Let me give you some examples. Suicide is a bigger killer for men my age than cancer. In fact, it's the leading cause of death for men in their 20s, 30s and 40s. More than any disease, suicide kills more. It's also the leading cause for women in their 20s and 30s, though at half the rate of men. Last year there were nearly, um, another example, last year there were nearly a million recorded domestic abuse related crimes in England and Wales. A million, that's the recorded ones. Another one, alcohol killed nearly 8,000 people last year, mostly through long term and dependence related addiction. To put that in perspective, alcohol killed six times as many people as road accidents last year. Drugs killed another 4,500. So the devil doesn't need his minions to possess people. His lies are at work deceiving people in our world. The world is already dancing to his tormenting tune that ends in death. That's the world that we live in. And that's where this section uh, goes to. The sixth angel blows his trumpet, and four angels who have been held back are released. They were standing by the river Euphrates, the river where Israel's enemies would have to cross to attack in the Old Testament. Think about them being stood on the other side of the English Channel for us. And these four angels are to bring death. They unleash an army of twice 10,000 times 10,000. Now John could have written 200 million, that's what it works out as, in Greek, 
The Greeks virtually invented maths, so they did have a number for it. But the point here is not how great the number, it's, it's not the sort of number itself, but how great it is. If 10 in Revelation is a lot, 100 even more, 1,000 an awful lot, then 10,000 is an incredible number. Then twice 10,000 times 10,000 is unheard of. There weren't even that number of people in the world when that was written, just to give you an idea. Now, you might think of this as some great end-time battle. But actually, if you read it, it only kills a third of humanity. I say only a third. The Black Death, for example, in history, killed, is reckoned about half of humanity at the time. So a third actually isn't that big in historical terms. It's just a portion, a chunk. A significant portion, but not all. And the instrument of death is the horse here. It has a breastplate of fire and sulphur. The breath of fire and smoke and sulphur. And it kills by fire and smoke and sulphur. You get the idea? And the power is in their heads and tails. Their heads are lion's heads and their tails are snakes with heads. Lions and snakes, fire and sulphur. Again, we're supposed to be thinking about the devil. We're supposed to be attaching this to the demonic. When Peter speaks about the devil being like a roaring lion, Revelation 12 verse 9 speaks about the devil as being that ancient serpent, that ancient snake. So the devil doesn't just bring torment by his minions, he brings death. It's an escalation of the fifth trumpet. There's smoke in trumpet five, but here there's fire. The hordes of hell are unleashed on the world to bring torment and death to people. One of the characteristics of the age that we live in is death and suffering. Demonically produced affliction for no apparent reason except to torment and kill. As a loud voice from heaven will proclaim later on, Woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And yet... There is protection promised for God's people. Have a look at chapter 9, verse 4. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. This does not mean that Christians are exempt from suffering and death. But it does mean that we're exempt from pointless suffering and death. There is protection from the devil's wiles. In this life, God uses our suffering for his good purposes, to make us more like Christ. And ultimately, the devil can do us no harm. In 1 John 5, it speaks of the devil not being able to touch us. He can't snatch us from God's hand. Like the plagues in Egypt, his people are protected. But this is not true for the rest of humanity. The devil could point, uh, inflict pointless suffering through his minions. He can hold people in bondage and affliction just because he feels like it. But he's not here all-powerful. He's not like God. He's got his boundaries. God limits his control a third and no more. A chunk, but not all. It's like the devil is in some way bound here. More of this in chapter 20. But he has power, but not full power. Even with an army of 200 million. And even... With all his minions, all that he can inflict is controlled by God. And even that, that attack functions as a trumpet call to the world. A warning sign, a portent of impending doom. Like that light that flashes on your dashboard, you know, and you try to ignore it, but it just keeps flashing. But the shock here is that humanity is so stubborn that it doesn't listen. So lastly, the sting in the tail. Have a look at verses 20 and 21. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshipping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. The big surprise here is that after all these trumpets, even though mankind has been forewarned, even though there's not a place on the globe where this decreation is not pres present, 
Even though this demonic torment and destruction is happening across the world, humanity carries on as though nothing's happening. Worse than that, in fact, the course that we're going on involves worshipping the very things that are destroying us. Humanity carries on with its idols and its immorality as though nothing has happened, as though everything is fine. We've become so accustomed to this world that we've forgotten that this isn't how it's supposed to be. These two verses are put at the end of this section to show us what this has all been about. If humankind really were the reasonable, rational, unbiased people that we make ourselves out to be, then really we would have repented long ago. We would have seen the destruction and devastation and turned to God in repentance. We surrender, Lord, please take us back. But instead, we're pig-headed, stubborn rebels who insist on going our own way, even if it destroys us. If this whole section is supposed to remind us of the plagues of Egypt, then humanity is Pharaoh, who persecutes God's people and hardens his heart when God begins to decreate his kingdom, who refuses to repent, even as he watches his world crumble before his very eyes at the hand of God. Who continues to worship statues of falcons and cats and jackals rather than bowing down to the living God. And that's still where we're at. Thousands of years later we're no better. We can see our creation is broken and instead of bowing the knee to our creator we proudly think that we can fix it. We cast ourselves as hero and remake a morality that makes us look like good people where recycling is more important than righteousness, where littering is worse than lying, where fossil fuels are bad but flings are fine. We repeat the mistakes of the past in creating our own religion that makes us look good. We see that creation is broken and we think we can save it instead of repenting. We also see not just the futility but the destructiveness of worshipping idols. The hopelessness and torment that it brings, and yet we continue to chase after these things that are less than God. We see the damage that violence and infidelity, perversion and deception, scams and embezzlements, we see all the damage those things can do, and yet we continue on and abate it. Rather than repent, mankind is pictured here as blindly following the same path that it has always gone. And yet... The trumpets are sounding. The horns are beeping. Turn around, go back. It's like that scene on Bruce Almighty, where he says, God, show me a sign. And this is what appears right before him. Stop, turn back, dead end. People ask for signs from God, but the signs are all around us. At points in their life, their own, uh, in our lives, they're almost deafening, aren't they, in our ears. The brokenness of our world. We think God is deaf to our pleas for evidence and, and signs, when in fact, we're blind to what God is showing us. The signs are everywhere, the trumpets are sounding across the world. As our planet breaks, as people cry out in torment, as people suffer and die for their idols. C.S. Lewis, creator of Narnia and other things, wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Well, in Revelation language, it's his trumpet to rouse a deaf world. So the question is, will you repent? To repent is to stop what you're doing and turn to God, to turn around, to do an about turn, to give up on your idols, be they wooden or otherwise. In the end, they'll only destroy you anyway. Give up on your sin, whether it be immorality, impatience, injustice, or just ignoring God. Again, it's not like those things do you any good. Turn away from sin. Turn to Jesus to make you clean. As chapter 7 put it, wash your robes in the blood of the Lamb. Put all your trust in Jesus. Put all your eggs in this basket. And if you've done that, then remember that the clock is ticking. The trumpets are sounding. The end is coming. I'm not saying go around with a billboard, sort of walking around town. The end is nigh. But are you ready for the end? Are you ready for Jesus to return? 
Are you living in the light of the reality that is to come? What might that look like in our lives? Would it look like a life lived in worship to the Lamb on the throne? Speaking of his greatness with our words, speaking of his worthiness with our lives, speaking to our world with his gospel. So let's not be deaf to what Jesus is telling us, but as we hear the trumpets, let's live for him and speak for him, even as the trumpets sound around us. Let's pray. Father God, these are tough things that we've been looking at this morning. Father, it saddens us when we see our broken world, when we see things broken. But Father, help us not to despair. But Father, help us to turn to you in those times when we see these things, in times when we experience these things. Help us to live for you and show your worthiness throughout. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.